David, sorry to interrupt you there. You're you're on mute. I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our MHRC seminar this afternoon. My name is David Hood, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Glenn Foster, uh, who's coming to us from Vancouver. And um, let me tell you a little bit about Glenn uh, and his background. He's uh, he's a Western uh, lad. Uh, stayed in out west his entire career. He's born and raised in Vancouver and uh, did his bachelor's degree at UBC in human kinetics and then master's also in human kinetics with uh, Bill Scheel, who's a respiratory physiologist there. He then moved to Calgary and did uh, worked in the experimental medicine department uh, uh, and did his PhD there for several years and then went back to UBC to do his postdoctoral work. Uh, he was then hired at the UBC Okanagan campus, where he's been for about 10 years, and he's a, an associate professor there, and also the grad program director in the, the School of Human Kinetics at uh, o, uh, School of Health and Exercise Sciences at UBC Okanagan. So we're anxious to hear what Glenn has to say today, the neurocirculatory consequences of hypoxia implications for obstructive sleep apnea. This is a good broadening exercise for us, folks, uh, as we listen to some uh, some good respiratory physiology. Glenn, uh, please turn on your camera and open your mic, and uh, you can share your screen, and we'll take it away. Thank you for the kind introduction. Let's get my slides up. Okay, can you see my slides? Okay. Yep, it's all good. Right. Okay, so I'm actually I'm actually joining you from the Okanagan, which is where UBC Okanagan situation, which is in Kelowna, BC. It's about a four and a half hour drive away from Vancouver. Um, and I'll show you a, a nice picture of that shortly. But I'd like to begin by thanking the Muscle Health Research Center Student Committee for the invitation to present as part of this virtual seminar series. I'm very honored to share my research with you today. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the Okanagan, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan people. And I understand York University is home to quite a few Indigenous nations, and I urge you to reflect on your relationships with your local Indigenous communities. So as David pointed out, I've been a faculty member with the School of Health and Exercise Sciences at the University of British Columbia for about the past 10 years. And our institution, as many of you may know, has two primary campuses, the biggest of which is located in Vancouver. But I'm situated here at the smaller Okanagan campus, which is now 18 years old and located here in this beautiful Okanagan Valley. Our campus is home to about 12,000 students spread across nine faculties and schools, and also five research institutes. I direct the cardiopulmonary laboratory for experimental and applied physiology, which is dedicated to human integrative physiology research. The lab houses equipment that enables the measurement of pulmonary, cardiovascular, and autonomic nervous system responses to physiological stressors. Human physiology is stressed using techniques like lower body, body negative pressure as is in the picture shown here. We also use exercise, inspiratory loading, hypoxia and hypercapnia by changing the oxygen and CO2 levels in the gas that people breathe. And in some cases we travel to high altitude on high altitude research expeditions like this one here, located at the Barcroft Research Facility on White Mountain in California. Physiology in the lab is measured using standard equipment for measuring pulmonary gas exchange and ventilation, heart rate, blood pressure, blood flow, cardiac function, and we also do muscle sympathetic nerve activity measures. My lab's research interests are numerous. We are interested in the neurocirculatory consequences of respiration. Work in this area includes the influence of respiration on baroreflex and sympathetic blood pressure transduction, 
But we also have an exciting project underway developing a novel approach to quantify respiratory muscle perfusion using contrast enhanced ultrasound. My lab is also interested in how humans adapt to high altitude. And we have participated in several high altitude research expeditions, including a recent trip to the White Mountain Research Station where we studied breathing during sleep and the coronary response to metaboreflex activation. At the heart of today's presentation is my lab's interest in neurocirculatory plasticity induced by hypoxia or hypercapnia. Today, I will address long-term facilitation of the peripheral chemoreceptor and ventilation by intermittent hypoxia. Then I will address how the sympathetic nervous system is recruited to support sympathetic long-term facilitation following acute hypoxia. And finally, I'll end with divergent sympathetic transduction responses to intermittent and sustained hypoxia. Hypoxia comes in many forms, but is rarely sustained, but rather occurs intermittently. The intermittent exposure to hypoxia leads to cycling in blood oxygen levels. It is a naturally occurring phenomenon that can occur when climbing mountains or when working in high altitude mines. Even mountain climbers are exposed to repeated bouts of hypoxia because they often embark on multiple trips separated by return to lowland areas. Similarly, shift workers in high altitude mines, like the one shown here in Bolivia, will spend some time working in the high altitude mine, followed by a return to lowland areas between shifts. Athletes may even expose themselves to intermittent hypoxia on purpose in an attempt to improve exercise performance. One example of this is the live high, train low paradigm, which many athletes and national teams consider as a tool to enhance athletic performance. But intermittent hypoxia is also a feature of many chronic diseases, including sleep apnea. In this case, the intermittent hypoxia takes the form of relatively high frequency oscillations in oxygen saturation. It is important to note that the intermittent hypoxia that I'm referring to today may lead to certain adaptations or maladaptations that are not shared by all forms of hypoxia. The majority of research that I will share today comes from healthy human studies of intermittent hypoxia that are designed to emulate the hypoxemia of obstructive sleep apnea. However, acute sustained hypoxia shares some plasticity with intermittent hypoxia, and I'll share some of this research too. OSA, or obstructive sleep apnea, is a chronic medical condition involving repeated obstructive apneas during sleep. It is normally assessed by polysomnography. Shown here is a two-minute excerpt from a sleep study, and it, it includes measures of brain, muscle, and heart activity, and a variety of respiratory measurements that are used to identify airflow, chest, and abdomen movements, snoring, and oxygen saturation. In this example, there are three episodes of apnea where nasal flow ceases while chest and abdomen movements are present, identifying these apneas as obstructive in nature. Each apnea is associated with hypoxemia and also an arousal from sleep. The obstructive apneas typically last for about 20 seconds and are terminated by restoration of ventilation. For this reason, the intermittent hypoxia of OSA involves rapid and intense hypoxia, which repeats at a relatively high frequency. But what's so bad about intermittent hypoxia and sleep apnea? This pictograph highlights some important statistics and associations. First, OSA and other forms of sleep apnea affect at least 18 million in the US. But perhaps more concerning is that 90% don't even know they have it. About 70% of those who do have it are overweight, and this likely contributes to their increased cardiovascular risk, but most population-based studies agree that OSA is an independent risk factor for the development of hypertension. OSA patients have two to three times the risk of being hypertensive 
And this has major implications for the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke. So how do we simulate the intermittent hypoxia of OSA in the lab? Our approach has changed over the years and depends on the research question and the logistics of our measurements. A decade ago, we were interested in the pure effects of intermittent hypoxia. And so we clamped the carbon dioxide levels at baseline levels. These studies were conducted in a normal barrack chamber since we exposed participants to six hours of intermittent hypoxia for between one and four days. The chamber was kept hypoxic, but an oxygen diffuser was used to deliver oxygen at the nose and mouth every other minute to restore oxygen levels. Our interests at this time were focused largely on whether intermittent hypoxia associated with a night or more of sleep could augment blood pressure, chemoreflux sensitivity, oxidative stress, and impair nitric oxide bioavailability. We also demonstrated that the increased blood pressure caused by intermittent hypoxia required activation of the angiotensin II type 1 receptor. So this type of intermittent hypoxia exposure simulates moderate to severe OSA since it leads to about 30 oxygen desaturation events per hour. Our more recent studies have been focused on long-term facilitation of ventilation, the peripheral chemoreceptor, and the sympathetic nervous system, and consequently has required us to use a much shorter protocol that is capable of inducing plasticity while allowing us to make recovery measurements where we could observe the long-lasting maintenance of the plasticity. For these protocols, we adopted a 40-minute intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia protocol. The addition of hypercapnia better simulates OSA since each apneic episode consists of both hypoxia and hypercapnia. We also shorten the hypoxia and hypercapnia episodes to 40 seconds with 20 seconds of recovery. Our intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia protocol represents high frequency oscillations of oxygen and carbon dioxide and acutely simulates severe OSA. Each bout of hypoxia and hypercapnia reduces arterial oxygen saturation to about 83% and increases end tidal carbon dioxide by about three to four millimeters of mercury. The influence of intermittent hypoxia and hypercapnic hypoxia on blood pressure is robust. And we regularly see a four to eight millimeter of mercury increase in mean arterial pressure following both the six hour and 40 minute exposures. The rise in blood pressure following a six hour sham protocol is minimal but following a six hours of intermittent hypoxia, there is a strong eight millimeter mercury increase in mean arterial pressure in nearly all participants. We have shown that the effect of intermittent hypoxia on blood pressure is long lasting, albeit to a lesser extent in 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure recordings. This effect on blood pressure is believed to be the result of long-lasting neuroplasticity called long-term facilitation. Intermittent hypoxia has been shown to lead to significant neuroplasticity in animal models. For example, exposure of the carotid body to intermittent hypoxia for 60 minutes leads to sensory long-term facilitation. Sensory long-term facilitation manifests as this time-dependent rise in activity of the carotid sinus nerve after the exposure to the intermittent hypoxia. And this effect can last for hours following exposure. Long-term facilitation following intermittent hypoxia has also been shown in, in motor neurons, such as those innervating the upper airway muscles and those innervating the inspiratory muscles. In the upper airways, long-term facilitation is shown as tonic genioglossus muscle activity following intermittent hypoxia. Phrenic long-term facilitation is tonic activity in the phrenic nerve following intermittent hypoxia exposure, but it can also manifest functionally as ventilatory long-term facilitation. 
which is an increase in minute ventilation or breathing following intermittent hypoxia. Finally, sympathetic long-term facilitation can occur following intermittent hypoxia, manifesting as a tonic increase in sympathetic activity following intermittent hypoxia exposure. Sympathetic LTF is believed to be the uh, is believed to contribute, pardon me, to the elevated blood pressure that occurs in OSA patients. Daytime sympathetic activity is elevated in OSA patients and is thought to represent long-term facilitation of sympathetic activity following the nightly exposure that occurs to intermittent, uh, that occurs to intermittent hypoxia in, in OSA patients. Another type of plasticity that may also contribute to elevated blood pressure following intermittent hypoxia is augmented sympathetic transduction. Sympathetic transduction represents the processes involved in transducing a sympathetic action potential or burst into a vasomotor response. It represents processes such as neurotransmitter release and reuptake, receptor binding on the vascular smooth muscle, receptor density, and sensitivities of the smooth muscle contractile apparatus. In humans, it can be very difficult to interrogate measures of sympathetic transduction, but it is currently an area of intense study in the field of neurocirculatory control. <clears throat> the expression of ventilatory long-term facilitation in humans is highly variable. However, in our hands, the expression of ventilatory LTF is robust following as little as 40 minutes of intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia. It is important to realize that unlike phrenic nerve LTF, ventilatory LTF may have contributions from the peripheral chemoreceptor in the form of sensory LTF. My former MSC student, Tyler Vermeulen, now involved in R&D and product support with Kent Imaging, was interested in determining if we could observe evidence of peripheral chemoreceptor sensory LTF in men and women exposed to intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia. Tyler hypothesized that intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia would lead to increased ventilation throughout 60 minutes of recovery, illustrating ventilatory LTF, and that brief periods of hyperoxia to suppress the peripheral chemoreceptor activity would lead to greater depressions in ventilation following intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia. If there is tonic activation of the peripheral chemoreceptors, then hyperoxia should attenuate it along with ventilation. Finally, Tyler was interested in whether VLTF might differ between sexes. <clears throat> so he recruited healthy young men and women. They underwent pulmonary function testing and, and nocturnal oximetry was also conducted to rule out undiagnosed sleep apnea. In total, our sample included 11 men and nine women who were healthy and free from disease. And in an attempt to standardize sex hormone levels, females were tested during the early follicular phase of their menstrual cycle. <clears throat> Following instrumentation, part participants went through baseline measures. They were exposed to three one-minute bouts of hyperoxia to determine the baseline ventilatory depression to peripheral chemoreceptor inhibition. This occurred over five-minute intervals, beginning with four minutes with the end tidal gases clamped at basal levels and followed by one minute with n O2 increased to 350 millimeters of mercury. The ventilatory depression was taken as the difference in ventilation between the last 30 seconds of hyperoxia and the 30 seconds preceding hyperoxia. The three measurements were then averaged together to improve measurement fidelity. <clears throat> Next participants were exposed to 40 minutes of intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia, as discussed earlier. Following the exposure, there were nine more one-minute bouts of hyperoxia that were used to assess ventilatory depression caused by peripheral chemoreceptor inhibition. <clears throat> Similar to baseline, three consecutive cycles were averaged, leaving three post-exposure bins, which were compared with baseline. <clears throat> the data shown here illustrates minute ventilation at baseline and at five-minute intervals throughout an hour of recovery. 
Men are illustrated in the closed symbols and women in the open symbols. At all recovery time points, minute ventilation was elevated compared with baseline. This demonstrates significant ventilatory LTF. Nine male participants were able to return for a time control experiment. They were not exposed to intermittent hypoxia, but rather a 40 minute sham exposure. Unlike intermittent hypoxia, ventilation was similar to baseline, but was found to significantly increase following 40 minutes of recovery. So we took these data to suggest that after 40 minutes of recovery, external influences may be affecting ventilation and the increase in ventilation in our experimental group may not be entirely reflective of VLTF after 40 minutes. This figure illustrates the effects of intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia on ventilatory depression induced by peripheral chemoreceptor suppression. Following about 30 minutes of intermittent hypoxia, the depression and ventilation was significantly greater compared with baseline. <clears throat> In our time control data, we do not see the same waxing and waning of ventilatory depression that was observed following intermittent hypoxia. These data suggest that following intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia, there is tonic peripheral chemoreceptor activity that may represent the sensory long-term facilitation of the carotid body. It is important to note that the depression and ventilation induced by hyperoxia did not fully restore minute ventilation to basal levels. This is because VLTF reflects both phrenic nerve LTF and sensory LTF, which are distinctly different processes. And although both men and women achieved similar degrees of ventilatory long-term facilitation following IH exposure, the breathing pattern did differ between sexes. Women achieved VLTF by increasing breathing frequency, while men achieved it through both changes in breathing frequency and tidal volume. <clears throat> so to summarize this first study, 40 minutes of intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia leads to VLTF in both men and women, albeit VLTF is achieved through different breathing patterns between the sexes. Hyperoxia leads to greater ventilatory depression following intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia, providing evidence of sensory long-term facilitation of the peripheral chemoreceptor in humans. There are some important methodological considerations. First, females were tested during the early follicular phase of their menstrual cycle, and it is unknown if their response would differ at other points of the menstrual cycle. Second, our time control is comprised of only men. And three, our study required the addition of hypercapnia to intermittent hypoxia to elicit VLTF and sensory LTF, but this is more similar to what sleep apnea patients experience. <clears throat> Finally, end tidal carbon dioxide control was required during uh, recovery, so we kept the CO2 levels in the recovery period clamped at baseline levels. And this may be required to elicit or to illustrate the full expression of the LTF because it avoids the hypocapnia that normally arises from increased ventilation, which could constrain VLTF through central respiratory inhibition. My former PhD student, Brooke Schaefer, who's now a postdoc at the Oregon Health Science University in Portland, wanted to understand how the sympathetic nervous system and baroreflex enable sympathetic long-term facilitation in humans following sustained hypoxia. To do this, she collected muscle sympathetic nerve activity and used a signal processing approach to investigate neural recruitment patterns during 20 minutes of isocapnic hypoxia and 30 minutes of recovery. She hypothesized that sympathetic long-term facilitation would be mediated by the recruitment of large diameter sympathetic axons that were previously silent and that the baroreflex operating point of sympathetic action potential clusters would reset to higher levels to permit sympathetic action potentials to increase their firing rate. In humans, sympathetic activity is often measured in bursts per minute. Both hypoxia 
and hypercapnia increase sympathetic nerve activity. But only hypoxia leads to sympathetic long-term facilitation in the recovery period, not hypercapnia. <clears throat> sympathetic bursts are generated by pulse synchronous sympathetic action potentials. And we can use a novel wavelet decomposition approach to identify the sympathetic action potentials in the raw filtered neurogram. This figure illustrates clusters of action potentials of increasing amplitude and demonstrates how they contribute to small to large sympathetic bursts. At rest, bursts of sympathetic activity are predominantly composed of medium-sized action potentials that are strongly governed by the baroreflex. Large amplitude action potentials have low firing probabilities and are governed weakly by the baroreflex, similar to small, action potential, uh, small amplitude action potentials. But sympathetic activation during a physiological stress usually increases burst firing frequency as well as burst amplitude. And this is facilitated by two factors. First, resetting of the barrel reflex permits the medium-sized action potentials to fire at an increased frequency. And second, previously latent large diameter axons are recruited as evidenced by cluster recruitment. Unfortunately, the the classic approach to MSNA analysis using the integrated neurogram does not capture all sympathetic action potentials. In the resting state, 25 to 30% of action potentials occur outside of a detectable integrated burst. These are referred to as asynchronous action potentials. During a reflex activation, sympathetic activity is elevated and the percentage of asynchronous action potentials is reduced. It is unknown how sympathetic discharge and recruitment patterns contributes to sympathetic long-term facilitation. <clears throat> In this study, we uh, Brooke recruited healthy young men without cardiorespiratory disease and no evidence of sleep disordered breathing. And participants were instrumented for sympathetic measurements using microneurography of the fibular nerve. A face mask and pneumatac were used to measure ventilation. A gas analyzer sampled respired gas and our lab's custom built end tidal forcing system was used to deliver isocapnic hypoxia. Blood pressure was measured periodically from the right arm and used to verify the beat by beat blood pressure re readings measured at the finger. Pulse oximetry measured the oxyhemoglobin saturation and heart rate was determined from a lead to ECG. Finally, a fine tungsten microelectrode was inserted percutaneously into the fibular nerve to measure muscle sympathetic nerve activity. After suitable signals were acquired, baseline PO2 and PCO2 were determined before in introducing isocapnic hypoxia. Entitled oxygen was then clamped at 47 millimeters of mercury, while entitled CO2 was clamped at baseline levels to maintain isocapnia. Finally, PETO2 or entitled O2 and CO2 were restored and clamped at baseline levels, and sympathetic long term facilitation was assessed. The data were averaged over five minutes at baseline, the end of hypoxia and during early and late recovery. Here are 15 second excerpts of raw data from one participant where you can see the change in sympathetic bursting in the integrated neurogram. And you can also see the action potential firing in the bandpass filtered neurogram. <clears throat> the action potential shown on the right is the custom mother wavelet developed within our lab that reflects the sympathetic action potential morphology. And this is the mother wavelet we use to detect sympathetic action potentials using the continuous wavelet transform. Although other labs have used a similar approach as developed in Kevin Shoemaker's lab, 
our approach was developed independently based on our interpretation of the methods published by the Shoemaker Lab. The action potentials were then sorted based on their peak-to-peak -peak amplitude and binned into clusters using Scott's rule. Clusters were then normalized into 10 bins to permit between participant comparisons. From this figure, we can see how the number of action potentials change within each cluster. We can see the latent recruitment of large amplitude clusters during recovery. And finally, we can identify the distribution of action potentials across baseline, hypoxia, early, and late recovery. We were able to capture high quality SNA signals in eight participants permitting action potential analysis. Diastolic blood pressure tended to be elevated during hypoxia and early, early recovery. MSNA burst frequency, incidence, and total activity were elevated by hypoxia and remained elevated into recovery, demonstrating sympathetic long-term facilitation, as has been previously shown. MSNA burst amplitude was elevated by hypoxia, but was not significantly elevated during early or late recovery. T50 is a measure of the barrel reflex operating point, and we note that T50 is increased significantly during early and late recovery. This increase in operating point is required to permit the greater sympathetic firing frequency observed throughout recovery. <clears throat> there was no change in the slope of the barrel reflex threshold slope, suggesting similar response to increasing or falling blood pressures. Here are box and whisker plots for sympathetic action potential frequency, the normalized action potential amplitude, and the percentage of action potentials occurring outside of an integrated MSNA burst. Using a Friedman repeated measures ANOVA on ranks, we see that the action potential frequency and action potential amplitude are significantly increased during hypoxia, while the percentage of asynchronous action potentials were decreased. During early and late recovery, action potential frequency tended to return to baseline levels, but action potential amplitude and the percentage of asynchronous action potentials remained uh, reduced. <clears throat> to facilitate statistical comparisons, normalized clusters were grouped into small, medium, or large, so that the proportion of action potentials firing in these cluster sizes could be compared against total action potential frequency. During hypoxia and early and late recovery, we observed that the action potential frequency was made up of fewer small action potential clusters. There was also evidence of an increase in the percentage of large action potential clusters. These data suggest that sympathetic LTF is supported by fewer action potentials firing in small amplitude clusters and increased action potential firing in large amplitude clusters. In other words, there is a rightward shift in the distribution of action potential amplitude during early and late recovery. Finally, we considered the bare reflex threshold relationship across normalized clusters. We found that no, no effect on bare reflex slopes or discharge incidents within any action potential cluster. But in recovery, the bare reflex operating points were shifted rightward for all action potential clusters, similar to the T50 change we observed in the integrated MSNA barrel reflex threshold relationships. In summary, following acute hypoxia, we observed evidence of sympathetic LTF for at least 30 minutes after restoration of blood gases to basal levels. This was achieved as a result of the integrated sympathetic barrel reflex resetting to higher operating pressures. Our data indicate that sympathetic LTF is mediated by a decrease in the percentage of asynchronous action potential firing and a proportional shift towards larger amplitude action potential activity. <clears throat>
Bearer reflex operating points were shifted rightwards for all AP clusters in recovery, and there was no effect on bearer reflex sensitivity. These results may reflect the early mechanisms leading to elevated daytime sympathetic activity known to be present in OSA patients. <clears throat> now, can hypoxia influence sympathetic transduction? You know, another type of sympathetic plasticity that may heighten blood pressure following intermittent hypoxia. However, intermittent and sustained hypoxia may very well differ in this response. As we've seen today already, intermittent hypoxia increases peripheral chemoreceptor activity. The increase in peripheral chemoreceptor activity contributes to sympathetic long-term facilitation where it can increase vascular resistance and blood pressure. Elevated renal sympathetic nerve activity increases renin release and angiotensin II production, further increasing vascular resistance. Intermittent hypoxia also increases reactive oxygen species production, both on its own and through increasing angiotensin II production. The ROS production can decrease nitric oxide bioavailability, impairing vasodilator function, and furthering the increase in vascular resistance. Sympathetic neurovascular transduction defines how strongly a sympathetic nervous signal influences vasomotor activity and vascular resistance. Nitric oxide can inhibit, while angiotensin II can augment neurovascular transduction directly. Consequently, we anticipate that intermittent hypoxia will increase sympathetic transduction. <clears throat> However, sustained hypoxia results in local hypoxic vasodilation, which may reduce sympathetic transduction. This work was led by my former master student, Troy Stucklis, who is now a dentist in the greater Toronto area. So maybe some of you have met him in the uh, clinic. Uh, Troy recruited healthy young males for this project and participants were instrumented with fibular nerve MSNA inside of a lower body negative pressure chamber. Before and after the intermittent hypercapnic hypoxia exposure, LBMP was delivered in three minute stages to elicit a progressive increase in sympathetic nerve activity. Brachial artery blood flow was also acquired to permit us to measure local forearm sympathetic neurovascular transduction across the LBMP protocol. This figure shows representative data from a participant throughout the LBMP protocol. With progressive LBMP, mean arterial pressure was generally maintained, but sympathetic nerve activity was progressively increased. Following the intermittent hypoxia exposure, there is ev evidence of sympathetic long-term facilitation and a heightened responsiveness to LBNP. To assess forearm sympathetic neurovascular transduction, we looked at the mixed effect models that relate the change in forearm vascular conductance with the change in sympathetic activity before and after either a sham control or the intermittent hypoxia exposure. We observed increases in sympathetic neurovascular transduction of the forearm in both the intermittent hypoxia and the control conditions. And intermittent hypoxia did not appear to augment transduction any further. Unfortunately, these studies require participants to lay still for about two and a half hours, including the instrumentation time. Previous studies have shown this type of sedentary activity to have a significant impact on blood vessel shear stress which can reduce nitric oxide production and increase sympathetic transduction. However, previous studies also show that intermittent hypoxia has a differential effect on the upper and lower limb vasculature. So it is possible lower limb transduction might be impacted differently than, than uh, uh, and the lower limb vasculature is also more important for blood pressure regulation given its larger volume. <clears throat> For this reason, we were interested in the effects of intermittent hypoxia on systemic sympathetic transduction. And to achieve this, we related the changes in MSNA burst frequency with the change in diastolic blood pressure throughout the LBMP protocols. 
Changes in MSNA are known to affect diastolic blood pressure more than systolic blood pressure, owing to their effects on systemic resistance. So following control, we found similar transduction slopes throughout LBMP, but following intermittent hypoxia, the transduction slope was much steeper compared to the pretest. These findings suggest that intermittent hypoxia may augment sympathetic transduction of blood pressure, possibly owing to greater sympathetic neurovascular transduction within the lower limbs. However, acute sustained hypoxia may have a different effect on sympathetic transduction because of its local vasodilator influences. And this work was recently published in the Journal of Physiology by Brooke Schaefer. During hypoxia, there is an increase in sympathetic activity, but there is also global vasodilation. Hypoxic vasodilation is likely to reduce the effectiveness of the sympathetic vasoconstrictive signal. Previous work by Andrew Steele, while he was a master's student in Craig Steinbach's lab, demonstrated that the sympathetic transduction slopes were reduced during hypoxia but they did not remain reduced throughout the recovery period. During a recovery, burst frequency remains elevated, but the global hypoxic signal is no longer present. Also during a recovery, blood pressure is normal, and this might suggest that transduction should be reduced. The method used by Steele to assess sympathetic neurovascular transduction has been shown to be sensitive to the background burst frequency with higher frequencies leading to reduced transduction. Additionally, as we discussed earlier, the integrated SNA analysis approach does not capture all sympathetic activity since sympathetic action potentials can occur outside of an integrated burst. As a result, Brooke wished to explore the transduction responses to action potential activity. The purpose of this study was to investigate how sympathetic action potential activity influences the sympathetic transduction of menotrial pressure at rest during 20 minutes of isocapnic hypoxia and a 30 minute recovery period. It was hypothesized that hypoxia would attenuate sympathetic transduction of MAP by decreasing uh, synchronous action potential transduction. That sympathetic transduction of MAP would return to baseline levels in recovery and that the MAP responses to asynchronous action potential activity would be less than synchronous action potential activity. To address this re these research questions, we reanalyzed data from our prior study oh, pardon me, uh, on acute hypoxic sympathetic recruitment strategies across seven minute periods at baseline during hypoxia and early and late recovery and the longer analysis time was necessary for the assessment of dynamic transduction using event-triggered signal averaging approaches. At each time period, we determined the menotrial response to synchronous action potential activity, asynchronous action potential activity, and no action potential activity. We quantified sympathetic action potential transduction using a signal averaging approach where changes in pressure are tracked over the course of 15 cardiac cycles. First, we identified all synchronous action potentials shown in red and tracked the average pressure changes following synchronous action potential cardiac cycles. When done for all synchronous action potentials, a positive change in menotrial pressure is identified. This analysis produces identical observations as would the burst triggered signal averaging approach typical of the integrated MSNA analysis. Next, we identified all asynchronous action potentials illustrated in green and tracked the average pressure changes following asynchronous action potential activity. Oops. Generally, menotrial pressure is falling uh, uh, is following following asynchronous action potential activity. And finally, we identified all cardiac cycles in which there is no sympathetic activity and the, identified the corresponding pressure changes over the next 15 cardiac cycles. 
and cardiac cycles with no sympathetic activity generally shows a fall in mean arterial pressure. For each of these cases, sympathetic transduction was defined as the peak or nadir pressure change that occurred between the five to nine cardiac cycles after the event triggered event, uh, cardiac cycle. <clears throat> Seven men were included in this analysis, and as expected, hypoxia had little effect on diastolic blood pressure, but sympathetic burst frequency was elevated by hypoxia and remained elevated throughout recovery. First, let's look at the typical integrated MSNA transduction response. The left-hand figure illustrates the signal averaged response, while the right-hand figure provides box and whisker plots showing the peak or nadir values that reflect transduction. The response associated with sympathetic bursts is shown in red, while the response to non-burst cardiac cycles is shown in blue. During hypoxia, there is no change in the non-burst response, but the change in MAP associated with sympathetic bursts is reduced. This is also true in early recovery, but not late recovery. These data suggest that the sympathetic transduction of blood pressure is reduced by hypoxia and remains diminished into early recovery. This table shows the sympathetic transduction responses across both our integrated and action potential activity metrics. Note that the transduction according to sympathetic bursts is the same as for our ACE, uh, for, pardon me, for our synchronous action potential activity metric. This is because they reflect the same thing. As we saw on the previous slide, there was no change in transduction of the non burst cardiac cycles. However, we must consider the potential contribution of asynchronous action potential activity to, to transduction, which is not impacted significantly by hypoxia. But there is a trend for no action potential activity to be modulated by hypoxia and recovery. Although hypoxia did not appear to impact action potential transduction metrics, we did query how do these metrics compare within a condition as well to better understand the potential role that asynchronous action potentials play in blood pressure regulation. So this figure on the left illustrates the changes in mean arterial pressure following synchronous action potential activity in red, asynchronous action potential activity in green, and no activity in blue. And the figure on the right shows the, uh, the same box and whisker plots with the peak and nadir changes in mean arterial pressure. And when we look within a condition, we clearly see a difference between synchronous action potential activity and asynchronous and no activity. However, there's also a difference between asynchronous activity and no activity at baseline, suggesting that the asynchronous action potentials may constrain the fall in blood pressure compared with, with when there is no activity. And interestingly, this response is lost during hypoxia and throughout recovery when the asynchronous firing probability is reduced. So to summarize these two studies on sympathetic transduction, first, intermittent hypoxia leads to augmented systemic sympathetic transduction of BP, but not forearm neurovascular transduction. And this may be because of the effects of shear responses on the forearm. Two, sustained hypoxia reduces blood pressure transduction as per previous reports, and this effect was restored by late recovery. Differences in early recovery uh, may be a result of lingering vasodilatory influences of hypoxia. Three, the asynchronous action potentials appear to constrain the fall in blood pressure at rest, and this suggests that asynchronous action potentials may facilitate maintenance of BP between bursts of MSNA. And finally, there's no gold standard method for measuring sympathetic transduction in humans. And we use two very different methods in the two studies I showed you today. And it is possible this may influence the divergent effects of intermittent versus sustained hypoxia on transduction. So throughout the presentation today, we saw remarkable cardiovascular and respiratory plasticity induced by a continuous and intermittent hypoxia in humans. These likely contribute to the early pathogenesis of hypertension and OSA. Ventilatory LTF induced by intermittent hypoxia likely represents both phrenic and sensory LTF. 
Sympathetic LTF following sustained hypoxia is permitted by resetting of the barrel reflex and a greater proportion of medium and large diameter axonal activity. The percentage of action potentials firing asynchronously is also decreased. Finally, hypoxia reduces sympathetic action potential transduction of BP and asynchronous action potentials play a large, may play a larger role in blood pressure regulation than was previously thought. So I'd like to very much thank Brooke, Tyler, and Troy. They, they were critical for driving these projects forward. And I owe, owe, also owe extreme gratitude to collaborators, including Phil Millar, Anthony Incognito, and Massimo Nardone for their help with the, the micronography studies. I'd just like to thank everyone for listening and uh, I'd be happy to address any questions. Fantastic. <clears throat> Glenn, thank you very much. I learned a lot. <laughs> I, uh... Uh, I haven't heard a talk on this topic for, for a long time, and I, I'm, I've got some questions that are relatively simple, and I'm sure that other folks have questions too, and we'll take those questions through the uh, Q&A uh, mode on the, uh, on the Zoom call. Please type your questions into Q&A, and I'll read them out uh, for Glenn to answer. Uh, let me just ask some simple things to begin with, Glenn. Uh, I had no idea that 18 million people were affected by OSA in the United States. It must be a, that's almost half the population of Canada. Um, but uh, are, is, there, is it widespread knowledge that um, OSA is a risk factor for hypertension? Is that a, something that's widely known in the clinical community that is, is used to treat hypertension? Do you know that? or? Uh, you know, there's, there's definitely problems with that. I mean, I, I think it's well known and well established now that uh, uh, OSA is an independent risk factor for hypertension. Um, certainly sleep uh, specialists uh, and physicians, respirologists that focus in sleep uh, would be well aware of that. Sure. Um, the, the flip side, though, which is I think what you're getting at is, is what about patients coming in that are hypertensive and, and, and may or may not have OSA and, and you know, are they being assessed for, for OSA? Uh, and, and I would say that that's probably not the case unless there's reason to believe that they have OSA, whether it's uh, uh, snoring uh, that, that their, their partner uh, has identified or, or whether there's been witnessed events. Um, it is relatively well known, though, that uh, uh, people with hypertension, about 50% of those people that, that have, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, primary hypertension uh, also have uh, OSA to some degree. Right, right, right. I was noticing in your slide from your, from your paper from 2007, where you had those nice oscillations in uh, percent saturation of O2 and CO2, and then you also had snoring and all of that uh, very nicely done. So because you, if a person snores, and I'm sure there are people in the audience here who will find this interesting, if you snore, do you have, uh, are you having those oscillations? Is that an indicator that those oscillations in, in percent, you know, saturation of O2 and CO2 are taking place and that you are, you potentially have sleep apnea? No, not, 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 not necessarily, you know, snoring is, uh, can be a sign of, of uh, airflow limitations, which can help to predispose to obstructive events, but just because you snore doesn't mean you have OSA. Um, certainly snoring, you know, would not be leading to oscillations in oxyhemoglobin desaturation unless it's uh, uh, leading to apneas, yeah. Right, right, right. <clears throat> so, so what is the threshold for activation of the chemoreceptors that you talked about oscillations in uh, <clears throat> percent saturation from 100 down to 83% and right. increases in percent CO2 from 40 up to 44. What, what is the threshold for activation of those chemoreceptors that leads ultimately to an increase in sympathetic drive and ultimately to long-term plasticity changes? Um, I don't think we know that, yeah. 
I don't, I don't think we know that, right? Like we don't know what is the threshold for that type of plasticity to occur, right? So like if, if we were to expose healthy humans to an intermittent hypoxia protocol where say their uh, oxygen level only fell by 5% to, to 90% or something like that, uh, would that lead to sensory long-term facilitation or sympathetic LTF? I, we don't know that. There's, there's not enough studies in humans to, to be able to address that question. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But in your experiments, you're, you're making the, the oscillation big enough that we're obviously so that you can see some physiological changes and things. Like we're that. definitely, we're definitely using a sledgehammer, I would say. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let me, uh, let me see the Q and a questions. Heather Edgel's saying, great talk. Thank you. It's been fairly well established that women have impaired sympathetic transduction compared to men. Could you hypothesize what you might have seen in the last study presented had you included a female group? Yep, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And uh, you know, I, I think from a sympathetic neurovascular transduction perspective, the, the jury's still out uh, to some degree as to the effect uh, uh, that being a, a, a female has on transduction. There, there certainly are studies out there that show that there are no sex differences, but I also appreciate that there's a few studies out there that show very clear sex differences. Uh, they use different methodologies to some degree, and so it's a bit challenging to uh, to reconcile those findings. Uh, you know, certainly there is good rationale for why females should have reduced transduction compared to men. And so if I was to go by extension of that, I, I would, um, uh, you know, I, I would expect there to be certainly a, a, an attenuated response to intermittent hypoxia and, and hypoxia with respect to transduction uh, in women compared with men. Um, it is not clear to me, though, whether intermittent hypoxia and, and hypoxia would modulate transduction in, in, in women to this, uh, if at all, because, uh, because of their much lower transduction that, that, that they supposedly have. Hopefully that okay. addresses your, your question, Heather. <clears throat> uh, I, I was just, just to follow up on that. I thought I noticed, uh, you you showed the graph of BLTF in males and females, and you had, uh, the different, uh, black dots for males and open dots for females. And I, I thought I detected an attenuated BLTF in the female population. Uh, yeah, not, 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 sig not significantly. Uh, it didn't come out in the stats. Um, oh. You know, it, it wouldn't be surprising for, the, for it to appear that the women's ventilation is a little bit lower than the men in there because it hasn't been corrected for body size. So, so they should have a smaller ventilation at rest and even during uh, VLTF in those cases. Um, so another, another approach to that might be correcting for body surface area or, or even metabolic production, um, mm -hmm. to address that effect. But, um, the lack of, I think, I think it would be, a, a very much a power, a sample size issue to, uh, really drive those effects out. Okay. Um, Tanya Pereira has two questions. First question. I'm curious about the cross section between sex and aging in the peripheral chemoreflex and how this changes over the lifespan. If there are aging differences, are they driven by sex hormone loss or more by sarcopenia and weight gain associated with age? That's the first question. I guess we'll start with that. That's a fantastic question. Um, I don't think I know the answer, to be honest. Um, certainly, the peripheral chemoreflex sensitivity is and can be affected by uh, sex hormones. Uh, progesterone is a ventilatory stimulant. Uh, estrogen also can have effects on, on the uh, chemoreceptor. Uh, so yes, uh, there is sex effects and sex hormone effects on the peripheral chemoreflex. Um, how those change over the lifespan and with aging, I don't know that. I don't know that off the top of my head, but you can imagine, I, I guess, from a sex hormone perspective that uh, the, the, the female's chemo reflux should start to look more like a male's chemo reflux post-menopause. Yeah. yeah, that's reasonable. Wish so, I had a better answer to that question, sorry. 
Yeah, no, 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 it was a good question. And obviously it's an area of uh, what needs to be investigated. So second question also is a methodological question. Do you assume that sympathetic transduction is equal across the body? Would you expect that nerve activity would be different at a more relevant point of the body, i.e. the lungs? And could you measure that with another technique? That's the oh, another another fantastic question. Uh, no, you can't assume that transduction is equal across the body. In fact, there's, there are studies out there that show different uh, transductions between the upper limbs and the lower limbs, for example. Um, and so, you know, that, I think, you know, I tried to highlight not my apologies if it didn't come across in my talk today, but, you know, we, we very much found those divergent responses in, in our data and that the forearm did not appear to respond to intermittent hypoxia, whereas our so-called systemic transduction did. And presumably that effect was being driven by a lower limb transduction response, but we haven't tested that directly. Uh, with respect to whether the nerve activity would be different at, uh, at, at different parts of the body uh that's a that's a challenging one as well that's you know and, and that's been ongoing for years uh within the field of, of msna uh there's been some studies done where they look at uh, uh msna within the lower limb and one and, and within the upper limb and uh generally speaking uh, across a, a few different studies and you have to realize those are really challenging studies to do um, the burst activity is very similar between upper and lower limbs. So it, it does, so generally speaking, people that do this type of research think that the, the sympathetic outflow to uh, muscle is, is similar across limbs. Although I can think of a thousand reasons why it shouldn't, why it shouldn't be. Um, but that, that from what we measure, that seems to be the case. Hmm. Um, I was curious also about the same point, and that is you, you, you had pointed out, as you said, uh, I did pick up on that, that there's a, a, a intermittent hypoxia has a different effect systemically compared to the forearm. Uh, and I understood it to directly kind of address what Tanya was asking there. And I wondered about why that was. And when you talk about systemic, you're talking about um, I mean, what is the distinction that you that you're referring to there? That the forearm is different from the rest of the body. Uh, yeah, I mean it's a it's a it's a challenging play there because you know we're moving from something that's looking at neurovascular transduction, which is looking at something where we're looking at the change in sympathetic activity to a change in a vascular vasomotor outcome, yeah. whereas our measure of systemic transduction in that study uses diastolic blood pressure. So we're actually looking at what, what would be more appropriately termed transduction, sympathetic transduction of blood pressure. So there, there's nuances there that we don't know much about um, because we're still trying to find the most appropriate way to measure transduction in humans. Um, but the, the divergent effect between the uh, upper arm or the, the, the upper limbs and the lower limbs with intermittent hypoxia. That was a study done in my own lab. And that really is specific to uh, changes in shear stress. So the, the, so the, the change, the reduction in, in mean shear rate. So the, the stress faced on the endothelium in the arm is much greater than the change in the leg. Uh, and so that was one reason why we thought that transduction of the legs might be maintained and might be uh, a better reflection of, of the systemic uh, transduction assessment that we made. And the other rationale for that, of course, is that the legs are a much bigger volume and, and are much more important for the regulation of blood pressure than, than your, your upper limbs, for example. I see. Okay. Sorry, I guess I'm confused because I thought you said that there was really no difference between the legs and the arms earlier, but there, there apparently is in terms of simple. Well, we didn't, we didn't measure leg. We didn't specifically measure leg transduction in any of these studies. Um, but there are studies out there that show that lower, that leg and arm transduction are different and, and have different sensitivities to stress. Um, and my past work has shown that intermittent hypoxia has a differential effect on those two vasculatures with respect to shear stress. Mm 
which has implications for transduction. Okay, but if you compare the dominant arm versus the non-dominant arm, uh, you would expect similar vascular, uh, you know, vascular resistance or uh, uh, sympathetic activity. I guess would you dominant? Versus I would assume so. Yeah, I, I would assume so. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, if uh, let me just look and see if there are other questions. Um, we're after four o'clock now, after uh, one o'clock Western time. So perhaps it's uh, good for us to stop and uh, thank Dr. Foster for his great talk, educational talk. We learned a lot. Uh, Glenn, please, thank you very much for, for coming with us today. Stay with me for one minute, please. And folks, thanks for, for joining us uh, today at the MHRC seminar. We'll see you next time in a few weeks for our next seminar. Seminar is now over. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.